Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our Deep Water Wednesday. We have um, a, a really interesting class tonight. Uh, we are going to get into some of the um, finer qualities, I think, of uh, Moses's conversations with God. So I want to uh, just draw your attention to uh, the book of Je uh, Exodus tonight. We're going to be like in chapters 13, 14, in that range where the children of Israel finally do pack up and get moving. So before we get started, though, we got a couple prayer requests. One is for uh, Bill Menz. Bill is Christina Cup's dad, and he just found out he's going to need some bypass surgeries done next week. So we want to pray for him. And uh, also we want to pray for Joyce Lint. Joyce has been making masks for her neighbors um, in the apartment complex she lives in, and she does a good job. And we want to make sure that uh, she's able to continue to do that. She's having a lot of pain in her shoulders and back. And uh, that's all from, I think, the, the labor of love. So we want to pray for her. And of course, a couple of weeks, we're going to be going back to church, finally meeting together. Praise the Lord. Right. And and we need to um, be ready and uh, so we can go back safely. But at the same time, we want to make sure we, we are in faith and we need a people to show up and and we're just going to rejoice and uh, we're going to continue the broadcast at the same time like we always have uh, so that people can watch and and still hear the message uh, if they're um, they do have some of the high higher risk uh, factors in that we want to make sure that they stay home but still hear the word so let's pray and then we'll get started Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we just thank you and praise you. We lift you up, give you honor and glory. Father, you are the God of healing. You are the God that heals us. You are the God who takes care of us. You are the God who provides all of our needs according to your riches and glory. Father, thank you that it's not according to what we're able to produce, and it's not according to what we're able to think about, but Father, it is abundantly above all of that, and we thank you for it. Father, we pray for Bill, uh, Brother Bill Menz tonight, Lord God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we just pronounce healing over his body, Father, over his heart, over all the uh, arteries going into that heart. In the name of Jesus, we just take command over all of them, tell them to open up, tell them to make his heart be amazing in its function. And Father, we just give you praise for all the docs who are going to work on him. They are anointed by you, Lord God, to do the best work they've ever done. And we thank you for it. Father, we pray for Sister Joyce Lent in the name of the Lord Jesus. We pray healing for her back. Father, take all that stiffness and, and irritation out of her back that in the name of Jesus, she can continue to do a labor of love and witness Jesus Christ to those that are in the, her apartment building. Father, that they would be blessed as she makes masks for them. And Father, she goes about doing the work that you called her into. And we just thank you and praise you for it. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, we're going to have a great study tonight. Thank you for opening our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Hey, buenos noches, Mike. Good to see you. Uh, we want to get started in the book of Exodus. We're going to start with chapter 12, 1 and 2. And then we're going to jump from there into 13 and 14. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So this is the Lord speaking to Moses and Aaron. And he's this this is kind of a just a little fun fact for you. Jesus meets with Moses when, when it says the Lord. Now, the Lord spoke with Moses. That's talking about Jesus meeting with him. So Jesus meets with Moses. And, but this time, he changes the starting of their new year. They were celebrating with the Egyptians during the August-September period, kind of like the middle of August to the middle of September uh, would have been like their first month of a year uh, of our August-September. And they were kind of celebrating with them. It, for the uh, Egyptians, it was the month Thot, but the Hebrews called it Tishri. Now, this is the fall harvest 
when it would have come in, that's what they were celebrating. So the the end of the harvest season, or the actually the beginning of the harvest when it came in, but the the end of the growing season um, would have been the beginning of a new year. Now the Lord changes it to the month Abib, or later on it was called Nisan, and it was actually in the spring. And we know the spring represents new life. Well, what did they get? And, it, and it, how is it for the Lord who to just say, hey, I'm just going to change when New Year's is? I mean, what if somebody did that today? Or if the Lord spoke that today and said, hey, this January 1st thing is kind of overrated. We're going to make New Year's Day uh, June 1st every year. Man, that'd be, that'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Uh, for the people living in the USA... It, this isn't a coincidental thing that many corporate fiscal year ends at the end of September. On the other hand, our tax refunds, if you get one, occur in April or the spring. In Scripture, the beginning of a new year means new life coming forth just as it happens in the spring. Jesus is our new life. This also speaks of our new life in Christ. God changed the time of, of the start of a new year to the start of a new nation delivered from bondage. So God just told him, hey, from now on, the new year, whatever you were celebrating before, not anymore. The new year is now the time that you get delivered. So when you uh, celebrate this in a year from now, you're going to celebrate this, this new deliverance, this new nation, and that's going to be your new year. For the believers, this speaks to the, the old has passed away, and now the new has come. Let yesterday go, move forward, is, is the example of the Lord for our lives. And, and that's what he tells Israel. Now take a look at Exodus 12.3. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Now, the tenth day is not just like an arbitrary day. Ten is represented by the Hebrew letter yud. And I got you a nice picture of a yud. A yud is actually supposed to be this. Yeah, a forearm with a fist means you worked. You, you, you made work. And it's supposed to be God's arm, God's arm of work. The yud means work or deed, and it's supposed to look like a raised fist with a forearm. Interesting letters. That is just an interesting thing. Work is the smallest of the Hebrew letters. You would think work would be a big letter, right? No, it's the smallest of the Hebrew letters. Now, Maybe work should be the smallest thing in our deliverance. Maybe us working for salvation. Maybe us working to have the favor of the Lord. Maybe us working to have spirituality. Maybe us working to do everything in order to in the spirit. Maybe the work thing is overrated. Maybe what we really need is to allow God to minister to us. Ten means divine order or a completed cycle, a completed group. A tithe is a complete gift to the Lord. So the number 10 stands for completeness, and it's not a coincidence that tithing or a tithe is a tenth. And now my thing, there it is. Jesus also used the number 10 as a significant number in some of his parables. There were 10 virgins, five wise and five foolish. There were also 10 silver coins that the woman had. Silver is the color of redemption. If you remember, she, she had the, the, the silver coins and she lost one. And she said, wait a minute, quick, everybody, you got to help me find this one coin. She only lost one. She had 10. But... She had to find that one coin. Why? Because 10 is a number that is complete. It's a, it's 
if it's 10. Adam to Noah were 10 generations. Then God destroyed the earth because of man's sin. So 10 means a completed moment with a judgment, good or bad. For Israel, we see God judges Egypt, which is a type of the world, and Israel, a type of the believer. Finding those covered by the blood innocent and those not worthy of death. So if you were covered by the blood, you were innocent and you weren't worthy of death. Like names, not umbers like names. Numbers like names through the scriptures are very significant. Take a look at Exodus 4. 12, 4 through 5. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him, him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make his your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. The sheep and goats were, um, yeah, good point, 10 fingers and 10 toes, and 10 commandments, right? In fact, I think I, when, when my thing froze, I actually missed. There we go. There were 10 commandments, 10 plagues of Egypt for Israel's deliverance. Abraham endured 10 trials. God would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah had there been 10 righteous in the city. Israel, 10 rebellions in the wilderness. Ten of twelve spies gave a bad report of the promised land. Israel gathered ten homers of quail when God gave them meat, not meat, the other meat, in response to their whining about the manna. Those that ate it died with the meat between their teeth. Laban changed Jacob's wages ten times. Ten of Joseph's brother, brothers went to meet him in Egypt, and he gave them ten donkeys. The foundation of the tabernacle was made of 10 by 10 silver sockets. Fire came down from heaven throughout scripture 10 times. Six is the number of man. And those were the number of judgments. Six times. Fire came down from heaven as a judgment. And that's the number of man. So we, we, 10 is a, is a very, very significant role throughout the scripture. Here we have them measuring how many lambs they're going to need for a house. Now, notice that God says, if your house is too small for a lamb. Okay, Ed, that is something I needed to know. I said my sound is cutting in and out. Is anybody else getting that as a um, kind of need to know about that? Okay, Mike, you're getting the same thing. All right. I got a new micro microphone, and I'm trying to make sure that it is um, working correctly. Missing. Okay. Well, I'm not sure if that's my internet connection or if that is actually... Your internet. You're completely frozen on me. Okay. If you guys can hold on for one second, I'm going to um, change my network connection and see if that helps anything. So just hold on one second, if you would. I'm trying not to be connected to the uh, Wi-Fi. Going, going direct, which is um, a good way to go. All right. Is that any better? I'm still frozen, Betty said. Still freezing. All right. I'm freezing and, and I'm choppy, right? Sounds okay. Mike says sounds better. All right. Well, praise the Lord. All right. I I think I may have um, corrected 
part of the problem, I think. Good deal. And if I could figure out how to uh, shut off the Wi-Fi part all, to, all together, I would. All right. Notice God says that if your house is too small for a lamb, if you can't seem to eat the whole thing, then get some help. That's really what he's saying. If you, if you can't eat the whole thing, get some help. Salvation is not a selfish endeavor. There are those to help us get through whatever we need to receive it. You know, um, I see that. Uh, thanks, Richard. Um, we, we have to get through. We have got to get through our salvation experience, and we're not going to do it alone. We need everybody else. That's the reason why there's a body of Christ. It doesn't say there's a person of Christ. There's a body of Christ. And what this is talking about here, when it, when it says, if, if the lamb's too big to eat, just in your house, it, then get some help. Go to your neighbors. Share, share one with them. Now, God does not say if your house is too big. If you're too big for the lamb then you probably have a problem. You notice that? There's nothing that's, he doesn't say anything about, hey, if you have too many people in the house. He does say, if you don't have enough people in the house to eat the lamb, go get some help. But if you're too big for the lamb, then I think you got a problem. Death is knocking at your door if you're too big for the, for the lamb. The assumption here is that everyone is small enough for the lamb. Make yourself small enough. Now, this is an obvious representation of Christ, the lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus is represented by the lamb. And Jesus is the lamb taken to slaughter for the sins of the world. Oh, hey, that's a good point, Richard. There is a sacrifice um, mentioned later on down the road that if you're too poor for um, to buy a lamb, then you can go share with somebody else if you can't afford to have one. That, that came in much later on down the road. But from the beginning, God says, hey, if your house is too small to eat the whole lamb, because the whole idea is to take everything of Christ. And, and it's, um, I, I got another verse I want to get to for that. So just hang on to that thought for a minute. Jesus is the lamb taken to slaughter for the sin of the world. He was without blemish. The male, people say, well, why, why would, did it have to be a male? Well, the male carries a seed, so the lamb was to be a male. The first year, the males were, or the, the sheep or the, the lambs were tender and savory. So they were well eaten. They, they, um, they weren't hard to digest. All of this stuff is a picture of Jesus. All of it is. All of it's a picture of Jesus. And the reason why it's a picture of Jesus is, and, and he picks a lamb. Why didn't he say, go out and get a sheep? Go out and get a goat? Go out and get a cow? Because it wasn't to be, the, the sacrifice wasn't to be overwhelmingly too big for you to, to take. I mean, what, what if salvation was a great big thing? You know, what if, what if, the the it was it was overwhelming. What if it was it was something that was just too big for you to wrap your mind around? And and so everybody said, yeah, you know, that's just too big for me. I I just can't swallow that. Although I will tell you, in church life, we have made salvation a huge thing. I mean, it is a huge thing. But I mean, we've made a huge thing to get. You understand what I mean? We've made the lamb. 
that was supposed to be a little lamb of the first year, tender and savory, easy to eat, easy to consume. And you could eat a lot of it because it was good. Nothing worse than eating something tough and chewy, right? But we've done exactly that with the gospel. We have made the gospel tough and chewy. We have made the gospel hard to, to swallow. We've made the gospel so legalistic, so big, so overwhelming. And, and we throw that into people's laps. You know, well, as soon as you get saved, well, now, you know, you got to stop drinking, smoking, cussing and, and all the other things that you do. And, and you got to act like this. And you got to act like that. And it makes it work. It makes it stressful. It makes it men's rules make it overwhelming. God never intended for our deliverance, our salvation, to be overwhelming. He intended for it to be easy. That's the reason why he gives these instructions. That's the reason why he says it exactly like he says it. Jesus was not supposed to be hard and tough to chew. Take a look at Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke, listen to this, my yoke is easy and my burden light. You see that? Jesus here is talking about himself, really is the sacrificial lamb of God. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Now, the lamb represents purity. Innocence, peacefulness, and joyfulness. Lambs tend to hop around and skip a lot, and, and they're they're really very playful little critters, you know. Jesus never gives us any unction to fear him. A lamb is not threatening, nor is it a thing to fear, but rather invites gentleness and affection. I did a little reading on the habits and the um the way lambs act and and uh, some of the finer points of um, being a shepherd when it comes to the lambs. They're, they're really very uh, gentle and playful creatures, very, very loving, like a puppy dog, really. And, um, and they're soft and cuddly and all those things. Why would Jesus say, I'm the lamb of God? Or why would he put out there that he was the lamb and why would the scripture say he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world as a lamb? Instead of saying he was some fearful beast. Yeah, because he was innocent, because he he was he was pure, because he was everything that we need to embrace. So we get to, to the first deliverance by a lamb with Moses. Now, the number 14 plays a significant role to point us to Jesus in this passage right here, Exodus 12, 6 and 7. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and all the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Now, on the 14th day, they're to kill the lamb at twilight. This is the time just before entering darkness. It, God didn't say kill this thing in the morning, in the middle of the afternoon, at high noon. He said, kill it at twilight, right before you enter the darkness, kill the lamb. The whole assembly was to eat it. Listen. There is only one way to salvation. The whole assembly. He tells them, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. It's the whole congregation that's got to do this. Not, you can have this way to salvation, you can have that way to salvation. Um, well, we like to do it this way. Well, we like to do it that way. Well, we believe this, that, and the other thing. Anything that is Jesus plus anything or Jesus minus anything, be honest with you, that's a cult. That's the purest definition of a cult that you can get. Jesus plus anything or Jesus minus anything. 
There's one way to salvation, and that's what God is already laying out. There's one way for them to be delivered. That's the Lamb. There, there, you know, if the death angel comes and you've taken and you put a flower pot outside your door, guess what? Be ready. He's coming in your house. If if you haven't eaten the lamb, you decided you just didn't want to eat the lamb. You you wanted to try something else. You wanted to do something else. It isn't going to work. It has to be the lamb. It cannot be the lamb plus something or the lamb minus something. It can't be, well, we skipped the lamb because we really didn't like lamb. We really thought we'd, we'd rather have a nice piece of beef. So we ate a piece of beef, took the blood of the beef and put it on the door. No, listen. It, you had to take the lamb. You had to take the blood. You had to put the door on the bud, on the uh, the blood on the doorpost, and that causes the death angel to pass over. It was the it says the the uh, the pillar going down the door and the the uh, post going across the top of the door. That actually formed a cross. When the blood would drip down, it actually formed a cross. Wow, can you imagine that? Thousands of years before Jesus. 14 is 2 times 7. 2 represents union. The 2 become one flesh. Also, the verification of facts are done by two witnesses. The Old Testament and New Testament are witnesses to the same God. We have two testaments, an old and a new. Two. Seven is the foundation of God's word. It is the number of God. He is seven, 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 while man is six, six, six. Since seven is the number of completion and perfection, God is thir- three times perfect. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It is also the day of rest. The number of 14 implies a double measure of spiritual perfection. There are three sets of 14 generations from Adam to Jesus, as described in Matthew 1. It was on the 14th day of the month that God made his covenant with Abraham. That was something new I didn't I didn't realize. Uh, I, I guess I'd read it, you know, a bunch of times. It was one of them facts that you, you read, you know, and you just kind of like, well, I just read over that and I don't remember what it said. But it was the 14th day of the first month. Just like this is the, the just like this. You think God isn't... Uh, God has a modus operandi. God has things that he does. He says, I'm God. I change not. Uh, he likes the 14th day of the of the first month. So he makes a covenant with, with uh, Abraham on the 14th day of the first month. He delivers Israel on the 14th day of the first month. And guess what? It was the 14th day of the month that Jesus died. During Passover, it was the 14th day that Jesus died. Man, you you think God isn't in control? Yeah, seven's the number of days that God created everything, and he created, what did he say after everything? It was good. It was good. It was good. Right? So, and then he rested. He rested. So on the 14th day, we got to understand God had something big planned for us. We already see the provision for Jesus. We already see the plan for Jesus. Back in the book of Exodus, the two doorposts, when sprinkled with blood, would form a cross as blood ran down. The sacrifice was to be consumed completely. We are to completely accept all that Jesus did for us on the cross and through his resurrection. We can't take the scriptures and, and take the scriptures apart and, and you know, kind of divide them up and, and say, well, I kind of like this part, don't like that part. Well, we can have this Holy Ghost thing, but, you know, I don't really care for the rest of it. Uh, or, you know, I, I don't see why we have to have communion. I don't see why this and why that. Well, I just don't want to believe those parts where God, um, you know, brings judgment down on people. I just choose not to believe some of this and I just choose not to believe some of that. no. He says you have to take and eat completely all of the lamb. Like the law, to be guilty of one part, to be guilty of all of it. If, if, I, if I'm going to accept one part of the scriptures, I need to accept all of the scriptures. 
to accept Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God as your Savior, is to receive everything that's in the New Testament, all the promises of salvation. Take a look at Exodus 12, 8. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Christ had to undergo the complete heat of his Father's wrath. Yeah, it's a good point, Richard. Accept all the scripture, whether you understand it or not. I can tell you, the children of Israel, when Moses told them to eat the lamb, the scripture implies they didn't receive that at first. They didn't understand. When he told them to stay in their houses, put the blood on the doorpost, he he prefaced all that by saying, listen, it's just going to be this way. You have to do it. He told the elders of Israel, the elders of Israel reinforced it to everybody and said, this is the way it's going to be. Yeah, that's exactly right, Mike. We, we need to stop extrapolating the scriptures and picking out what we want. It, it, we can't do that. We have to go with whatever's there. Jesus had to take the complete heat of his father's wrath. So these these uh, lamb had to be roasted in fire, not boiled, not put on a rotisserie split. They had to be roasted in fire, completely intact. And he tells them that they're going to, um, the unleavened bread is truth. And the bitter herbs speak of the bittersweet mission of Jesus to redeem mankind. This all speaks of Jesus. It's all types and shadows of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be new, a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Here he just says it plainly, right? Christ, our Passover. He is the Passover. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There he just says it. The unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, if you remember, Jesus went out on a boat with his disciples and he made a comment to them. And they th they thought um, he was talking about because they didn't bring any bread with them because he told them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He, he wasn't talking about the bread. He was talking about what leaven represents. Leaven, according to Paul, is the insertion of self-effort into our salvation the leaven of malice and wickedness. When he says your glorying is not good, it's because they were taking credit for their spiritual condition. They were glorying in what they had accomplished, who they were. Taking a little credit for what God gives freely corrupts the whole lump. When, when you can take credit for your salvation, when you can, when you can uh, perform in your performance, then is your salvation. You, that's leaven. It's being inserted into it. Our self-effort has nothing to do with our salvation. It's everything from him. That's the reason why he says, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Jesus is the truth. And he is the only way. Exodus 12, 10 through 11. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hands. So yet shall you eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, your salvation needs to be taken whole. And nothing should remain that can be corrupted by religion. That's the reason why he says, eat it all that night. What, whatever's left over in the morning, listen, rather have you burn it with fire. 
then, then leave it go. Now, think about this. They had no refrigeration. I, I know some people find that surprising. They, they didn't have any refrigeration, no way to keep anything from being spoiled. So meat, I mean, you know how it is. I, listen, I'm crazy about all this stuff, right? Uh, because if, if stuff sits out too long, I've had food poisoning. Stuff sits out too long, you know, at a buffet table or something, I'm not touching it. It, it can be the best, you know, potato salad in the world, macaroni salad, whatever. If it's been sitting, I'm not eating it. Well, meat back in that day, um, it it would it would spoil pretty quickly. Oh, Betty, <laughs> uh, it would spoil pretty quickly, and and so, um, they. It would get maggots. It would get corrupted. It, it would not be the same as when they first had it. Now, here's how. And, and, yeah, unfortunately, Mike, that they, they didn't have that put salt on dry meat program going on. Um, yeah, Ed, that's exactly right. That, that, that's the reason why meat packers, we've heard a lot about meat packers in the last few weeks, right? Meat packing houses, it's cold in there. Why is it cold in there? They got beef and pork, chickens hanging from the ceiling, you know, on hooks everywhere, going back and forth, getting cut up, packaged and all that kind of stuff. It's freezing in those places. And consequently, a good place, wet and freezing, consequently, a very good place for viruses to, to spread, right? But the reason why they keep them like that is because it slows down the rotting. Now, here they are in Egypt, and and it's hot. It's great for speeding up the, the rotting. Your potato salad is not bad. <laughs> yeah, we we did do that. The um, we had um, salad Betty had made with mayonnaise. We were young. Betty was pregnant, very pregnant at the time. And we were out and we were um, we were swimming at Melanie Morgan's house. And uh, so here she is. She's pregnant and we've got our food out. We're young and stupid and we got the food out sitting all day and we're eating down macaroni salad and potato salad and, you know, and all that that had been sitting there and, and uh, in the hot sun. I think it was like August, July or August. And uh the next couple of days, um, we both started getting sick. Betty got real sick and she calls me at work. Well, by then I'm turning green. My, I went in and said something to my boss and I couldn't hardly get the words out of my mouth. And he looked at me and he said, get out of here, go home. And, and I, I left and didn't make it home before I lost whatever was there. So it, it is not a good feeling. It is a horrible feeling. And when you eat something that's spoiled, when you eat something that it, listen, it doesn't have to be spoiled a lot, right? Just has to have a little bit of an organism growing in it. Next thing you know, you're sick. That's what he's talking about. Think about that. He says, when you take Jesus, listen, take him all. Don't leave any of it out there so that religion can get to it and spoil the message. Spoil what you got. People get saved. I hear this all the time. People get saved. Within days of them receiving Christ, they feel good. They feel innocent. They feel great, right? And then somebody tells them, well, did you stop smoking? Well, I, I didn't know I had to stop smoking. Uh, well, I don't understand how you can be saved and still be smoking. And they start thinking about that. You know, and then somebody else says, well, uh, have you been going to Sunday school? What do you What do you mean Sunday school? I, I didn't know we had Sunday school. What do you mean? Sunday? Why would I go to school on Sunday? I'm going to church on Sunday. Well, no, you could. If you're really saved, you should be going to Sunday school. And, and we put all these things into the pot, all this religion into the pot of the purity of salvation. Listen, get saved and enjoy it. God will show you the rest, but just be willing to take everything that Jesus gives. That's the reason why he says, 
don't let it hang out there to get spoiled by religion. It was to be eaten by faith. That's the reason why he had he said, put your put your belt around your waist, put your sandals on your feet, have your staff in your hand. Eat it by faith. If you're going to go sit and you're going to eat the Passover and you're going to say, well, geez, I hope this works. Man, I hope this death angel thing isn't just a farce. You know, we we had that uh, baked bean thing a couple weeks ago and it didn't work out so well either. You know, this Passover thing with the lamb, this better work this time. I'm, I mean, think about that. Somebody not prepared, not prepared. They had to be prepared So God said, show us your faith. Put a belt around your waist, sandals on your feet. When this thing happens, we're gone. One cannot accept the sacrifice with a wait and see if it takes attitude. You have to accept the sacrifice. It's going to work. I'm walking out of this. I'm walking out of this bondage. No matter what happens, I'm walking out of this bondage. The Lord told me I'm walking. I'm prepared for it. I'm going. And this all speaks of how we ought to reassure ourselves. It all speaks of that. How we ought to reassure the new believer. Tell him, listen, you are safe. Well, yeah, but do should I feel? It had nothing to do with your feelings. You think all these people that night felt like they were going to be delivered? I can guarantee you they did. But if they ate the lamb by faith with their belt on, their sandals on, their staff in their hand, and they said, I don't know how I feel, but I'm ready to go. When they blow that trumpet after this thing's over, I'm out of here. That's how we ought to get saved. Exodus 12, 35 through 36 says this. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing. Yeah, they were healed that night, all of them. It says that every single one of the the children of Israel, when they left, there was not one feeble person among them. Now, you have to know there were some some seniors there, maybe some mega seniors, right? There there had to be some young people there. There had to be somebody who, who had gotten sick or who was sick. But that night, the entire nation of Israel got healed and they all walked out. It said there was no, none of them were sick. None of them were feeble. Not one. Not one. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they granted them what they requested. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. Man, we ought to love this example. The, we ought to just love this example for our lives. God grants to the children of Israel favor in the sight of the Egyptians, in spite of everything that's going on, in spite of all the tragedy the Egyptians run into that night. They give them whatever they ask, silver, gold, clothing. This is a prequel to what Jesus did in plundering the devil. It says that he made a show of him openly, is what the scripture tells us. Jesus went down and plundered hell. He made a show of hell openly. When God releases us from our captivity, he provides the blessing. He provides it. Wow. Awesome thing. Exodus 12, 43 through 48. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it, but every man's servant who is brought who is bought for money when you have circumcised him then he may eat it a sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it in one house it shall be eaten you shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house nor shall you break one of its bones now that talks directly to Jesus right there it says none of the scripture prophesied that that none of Jesus's bones would be broken It's a direct picture of who Jesus is. You shouldn't take any of the flesh outside. What Jesus did is for the church, for the body of Christ. His healing, his peace, all of it is for us. His flesh was broken for our healing. 
This is a tremendous gift, and it's not to be used in the world for men to boast. And, and that's really the, the implication here is, listen, if it's somebody in your house, that's who the blessings are for. To take it outside of the house and exploit the gifts of God. I'm, now, I'm not talking about having evangelistic rallies and getting people saved. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about praying for people who are sick. Jesus prayed for all kinds of people. In fact, everybody Jesus preached to was lost. Jesus didn't preach to churches. He preached to lost people. Every one of them were lost, including his own disciples. Nobody was saved until Jesus went to that cross. Nobody was saved until he resurrected from the grave. Nobody was saved until he was seated at the right hand of his father. Nobody. Salvation wasn't there. It wasn't until Jesus released it to mankind that people were able to get saved. Now, they, they could believe that he was, he was the way. They could believe that he was, um, was going to do something. But until it happened, it, they did find the way, Mike, from, through Jesus. And, and that was it. But until Jesus, they were only looking forward to deliverance. When Jesus comes, he, he, he begins to preach a message they had never heard, and people are saved. They're giving their lives to him. They're, they're looking forward, and he healed them all, it said. I mean, we read that in the Scripture several times. They brought all these people to him. They were all sick, and he healed them all. But he didn't heal them all to exploit the gift. He didn't heal them all to exploit or for his own gain. It was all for the kingdom. It was all for the kingdom. He tells that to his church. We have tremendous gifts in the church. And some of the stuff that has gone on over the years in, um, in ministry that is given ministry is particularly telev television ministry, a bad name. Um, that's what this is talking about. You can have it, but it's not this, this great gift is for the body of Christ. You want the gift. You need to be in the body of Christ. Come into it. You can have all you want. Just come into it. That's the message of the gospel. Listen, I've got it all here for you. Come into it. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and it. And he shall be as a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. And it says here, this, this is really speaking of our communion, this whole thing. It's, it's all speaking of our communion. It's not to be eaten by those who do not believe in its mission. This is all for us. Exactly, Mike, he does. Jesus says that. I, I, see, I do what I see the Father do, and I, I speak the words that my Father gives me. The stranger dwelling with us is to get saved before participating in the Holy Communion. It, they were supposed to. They can be saved through communion. But the communion doesn't do them any good. Being uncircumcised is an image of one with the excess flesh still being attached. Paul alludes to eating in an unworthy manner in 1 Corinthians. This is the reference for that teaching. This, this part right here is the reference for what Paul taught in 1 Corinthians about eating in an unworthy manner. It doesn't have anything to do with sin, but it has everything to do with belief. Why do we have communion? Why are we eating? Why are we going back through that? Because really this Passover is what Jesus did. That's when he ate the meal with the disciples. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, and I want to show you from the old original Aramaic version. Uh, 
I think it, it, it brings out a lot of things that you need to see. For I have received from our Lord the thing which I handed to you, that our Lord Yeshua in that night in which he was betrayed took bread. And he blessed and he broke and he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for your persons, for your persons. In other words, your, your, your physical being. Thus you shall do for my, for my memorial. So after they had dined, he also gave the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. You shall be so doing every time that you drink for my memorial. For every time that you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you commemorate the death of our Lord until his coming. Now, there's a real important part that comes right after that. Whoever eats this bread of the Lord Jehovah and drinks from his cup and is unworthy of it is guilty for the blood of the Lord Jehovah and for his body. Because of this, let a man search his soul and then eat of this bread and drink from this cup. For whoever eats and drinks from it, being unworthy, eats and drinks a guilty verdict into his soul for not distinguishing the body of the Lord Jehovah. Because of this, many among you are ill and sickly, and many are asleep. In other words, they're dead. It's pretty strong language from Paul. But he's laying out the, the fact of the communion as it was exactly with the lamb being slain and the unleavened bread and them being in the, uh, in the bunker, so to speak, on the night of the Passover. It was at the Passover that Jesus instituted the Holy Communion for we believers. Now, this unworthy manner thing, people get all caught up on that, but I, I want to explain that for you a little bit. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by our Lord, we are chastised so that we would not be condemned with the world. From now on, my brethren, whenever you assemble to eat, you shall wait on one another. This whole series of verses references the deliverance from Egypt. When the children of Israel were set free, they experienced no sickness or disease for the next 40 years, except for that brought about as judgment because they refused the Lord. When they refused the Lord, he, curses came, God pulled his hand of blessing back, and sicknesses came amongst them. Yeah, their shoes and their clothing didn't wear out. I mean, they had food dropped on the ground every morning. Now, they were, in a sense, not discerning the Lord's body. The self became the central figure in their lives, and that's exactly what happened to the children of Israel when, when they were out in the desert and sickness and de disease did come on them. It is because, at that point in time, they started thinking about them. They weren't discerning the, what the Lord had done for them. They, what the Lord said to them was, every time you do this, Remind yourself of when I delivered you. Remind yourself of the deliverance, because then you'll stay in connection with me. You'll understand where I'm coming from. You'll understand I'm here for you. I delivered you. I brought you out. That's why we have the communion. It, it is a, mem a memorial to the Lord to say, <clears throat> I remember my salvation. I remember what you did for me. I remember your broken body was broken for me and for my healing, for my person. To remember that is to put your faith in it. To just take communion as a ritual. Just like, what are we doing this for? Everybody else is eating this piece of bread. Man, I, I, am, I am really kind of hungry. I could use a little bit. I wonder if they can give us a couple pieces of that bread. I wonder if I can drink a little bit more wine. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians. He said, when you guys get together, there's some of you are coming and you're starving. You, you're, you're eating a whole meal. When we're, we're breaking bread, you're eating a meal. Some of you are getting drunk off the, the cheap altar wine. You know? And, and Paul says, listen, that's why there's people sick among you. That's why somebody, some of them are feeble. That's why they're dying. It doesn't have anything to do with their sin. It doesn't have anything to do 
with what church they attend. It doesn't have anything to do with any of that. It has everything to do with what they believe about the broken body of Jesus Christ for their life. What they depend upon for their salvation. That's what this is talking about. What are you depending upon for your deliverance? Are you depending upon religion? Are you depending upon yourself? Are you depending upon your good works? Or are you solely depending upon that lamb slain from the foundation of the world? Because when you put your faith and your trust there, you put your buckle around your your, uh, waist, you put your sandals on your feet, you hold your staff in your hand, you say, It doesn't make any difference what I feel. I'm ready to go. I'm eating this knowing that the Lord is here, and I believe this is going to happen. That's what changes lives. That's when it becomes real. That's why he says, don't eat in an unworthy manner. An unworthy manner is not people sitting around saying, man, did I confess all my sins? Did, Did I... Did I forget something? I better not eat. I better not eat that bread because I, I I might have forgot a sin. It listen. It is better than that. It's better that you remember every single sin that you ever committed at that time, and then eat. Because then you are remembering that God took those sins and cast them as far as the east is from the west and delivered your soul. That's eating in a worthy manner. When you say I can't get rid of this. But I know that Jesus can. I can't be forgiven, but I know that Jesus has. I can't be healed, but I know that Jesus heals me. That's why he says, if we're going to judge ourselves, we're not going to be judged by the world. We're not going to be judged by everybody else. What do you mean by judging? What do you believe? Not what, what have you done? It has never been what have you done. It's what do you believe? What do they what did they believe about that lamb? What did they believe about that blood on the doorpost? What did they believe about putting their sandals on their feet, putting their having their staff in their hand, having their belt around their waist? What did they believe about that? That's what this is about. Not about what you did or what you feel. Mike, that's a good point. Mike says most people think that they did a big a deal for their salvation instead of what God's showing them mercy on his people. Yeah, it, it most people do. They, they, they think, man, I, I, I did something for my salvation. We haven't done anything. In unpacking these verses, we find several types and shadows. Paul tells us to wait for one another to eat our bread and drink our juice. The idea of unity is prevalent throughout the scriptures. The discernment of the Lord's body is not judging everyone else. It's also not searching your own soul for sin. In the Passover meal, The lamb was discerned, not the people sacrificing it. Do you see that? The lamb was what was discerned. The lamb had to be without blemish. The lamb had to be a certain age. The lamb had to be a male. It was the lamb, the lamb, the lamb. It was not the people, the people, the people. It was the lamb, the lamb, the lamb. When they ate together, they weren't judging themselves, but they were judging the lamb. And if you're all eating, by the way, how can you judge everybody else if you're all there and you're all in the same boat? They only had to find the lamb worthy. They didn't have to find them worthy. When we eat in an unworthy manner is when we do not accept the finished work of Christ and insert our own will. From the beginning, Christ was to be the totality of our salvation apart from any works which we've done. Just as the Lord instructs Israel to participate in the Passover meal in remembrance of him, bringing out of Egypt, them out of Egypt, he instructs us to eat the Holy Communion in remembrance of what he did to bring us out of our sin, us out of our bondage. By far, by far, the most important thing that we can do as a congregation of believers is have communion together. And remember just this. It, it's got to take the preeminent place in our church houses, in our worship, the communion, having the communion is more important for all of we believers because of what we express about what we believe than everything else that we do. 
it's the very thing that our our faith is placed if, if it's if it's placed appropriately the communion will be life to us spiritually and physically if we have a discerning heart we will examine Christ and find him worthy it will result in blessings of faith that heal us emotionally spiritually physically that's what the passover was about that's why it's important that's why the jews still do it to to this day and that's why it needs to be something that we do not the passover meal but as jesus said break the bread drink the juice remembering discerning the lord's body amen well, that is the, the lesson for tonight. I hope you all got something out of it. I had a bunch of fun facts in there. And uh, we will have the next step. They're, they're, they're going up to the coast of the Dead Sea next week. And the Lord speaks some profound things to them as they cross over and they get to the other side. There's some interesting things, exchanges that they had as, as they come to Mara, the bittersweet waters, you know. So. Um, Y'all have a great day. Be blessed in the Lord and in the power of his might. His face will shine upon you and grace will overtake you. Blessings to everybody. Have a great night.